Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Conway Anderson. Uh, you may know me as the civil pasture researcher um, at the Center for Agroforestry. And I'm here to give a program update of all of the victories we've had in our lab over the past year and uh, what we're looking forward to in this coming year. Now, just as a refresher, um, if you've been to the annual review before, you've heard me uh, talk about this slide, but when I was hired, I'm coming on my third, uh, or coming up on my fourth year, three and a half years here at the center. And my, my overall goal um, when I was hired was to develop a civil pasture research program. And I've really broken that down into um, two primary types of temperate hardwood civil pasture systems in Missouri and looking at ways to explore and test applied and basic research questions um, for both just the scientific understanding of how civil pasture might work here in Missouri and in other places that resemble Missouri, um, but then also how it can help producers and with um, increasing agroforestry adoption. So uh, what that comes down to is investigating a woodland type civil pasture. Um, this would take an already existing stand of woods and figure or test and explore different types of management strategies that would enhance not only the health of that woodland, but also create opportunities for civil pasture among woodland owning cattle producers um, and really promote it as an alternative to unmanaged woodland grazing that can be detrimental for those trees. Also, uh, the other side type of civil pasture that we look at um, is what I refer to as plantation civil pasture. And this is really a broad all encompassing term. So this could include uh, a timber, a standard timber civil pasture system where we're growing uh, pine trees or specialty crops like an orchard, um, pecans, chestnuts, et cetera, or something more highly integrated uh, perennial civil pasture system that is uh, highly multifunctional and very, very specific to the individual needs of the producer. Uh, with that type of system, also looking at just different types of agroforestry tree fodder and trying to evaluate um, different strategies for integrating livestock into perennial systems. So all of the projects that we have going on and are looking to adopt in the future uh, target one or more of these uh, areas or questions. So they're all trying to come back to this overall goal of trying to understand better um, how best to integrate livestock in an agroforestry system. So I won't spend too much time on the ongoing project updates. Um, I have a wonderful lab full of uh, advisees that are going to be talking about their portions of their work um, on all of these projects. Um, so I'll, I'll be brief about this. Uh, Seth Christman is going to talk about um, the woodland transition of civil pasture, the project that we have ongoing at Wordak Farm. This is a large scale project that's funded through SARE. Um, uh, we got our research and education grant and we're beginning our third year of that project. Um, the other uh, half of that project, that grant that we got uh, included a woodland civil pasture survey. And Kendra Esparza Harris will be talking about um, some preliminary results from that survey. Um, Additionally, we have an ongoing elderberry fodder project and Eric McKinsey is doing his master's work on uh, evaluating the nutritive value of uh, elderberry um, as a perennial forage source for livestock and that's what he'll be sharing. And finally, we have an online uh, advisee who worked really hard this past year to uh, publish a paper. So we have a civil pasture, sustainability of civil pasture review with some pretty interesting findings that Sinu and she will be talking about as well. And finally, I have no student talking about this, but um, it's been talked about already this, this past year um, at the previous uh, agroforestry review and also presented at the World Agroforestry Congress are findings from our small elderberry silage study. Um, and that can be, that information has been published, uh, was recently published in December and is available uh, on our Center for Agroforestry website. So I encourage you all to uh, investigate and, and find out more about those findings from our preliminary study. And I hope to carry that project a little bit further as well. So I won't, because I won't be spending too much time on uh, the students' work, I want to focus on some of the other things. But first off, um, as Seth has uh, finished up and is sharing the progress down at WordAC, 
uh, we have finally implemented our logging treatment. So right now, um, a large scale timber harvest is occurring, occurring on our study site down at Wordack Farms. Um, and I have some, this is a, again, a, a picture of our reference site and all of these trees marked here with uh, tape are trees that we're keeping. And you can see here we have a few sketchy pictures that aren't the best quality element, but they're the preliminary ones that we have right now of um, the loggers who have are, are clearing this land and leaving our marked trees. Um, and it's, it's, it's very clearly gonna make a very large impact on the site. So we can't wait to see what this coming year of data will produce with um, this large treatment that's being applied to the, the plot. So other upcoming projects that we have ongoing, um, I know we recently uh, said goodbye to our agroforestry economist and Kai at the center, and we are very sorry to see her go. Um, and this is really a project that I would have wanted to share with her, um, <laughs> but we reached out, uh, we were reached out, um, contacted by the Economic Research Service uh, after she left to, uh, represent the, the agroforestry and our research um, by working on a report for congressional request. Um, and this ER, this uh, report, a request for report is really focusing on the agroforestry component of continuous living cover. So the request came um, in the fiscal year of 2020, and it directs the Economic Research Service to produce a study on continuous living cover practices that include a discussion on the demand side of continuous living cover practices and potential markets. So we're gonna be looking at analysis of markets for products and inputs, profitability of those systems um, compared to other alternatives, um, and then the impact of these systems on local economies. So I have in the coming year, a plan to implement a small project that is going to focus on the agroforestry component um, so continuous living cover being the definition of land uh, roots in the ground all year round. So uh, this is a coin or a term that's been coined by Greenlands Blue Waters, and it made sense to bring them in as a partner on this project. So um, we are going to be focusing primarily on the agroforestry portion. Um, but as a, uh, a reminder, continuous living cover includes not just agroforestry, but perennial biomass, perennial forage grazing, perennial grains and winter annuals or cover crop rotations. So we're really looking forward to seeing what, um, what comes from this research and continued partnership with Greenland's Blue Waters. Additionally, uh, Kendra Sparza Harris, uh, the PhD student in our lab, uh, applied and received a NRC SAIR graduate student grant. Uh, it was about $15,000. And we are beginning a grazing study this year, which is very exciting. Uh, we're gonna be looking um, at the comparison of open pasture grazing to an improved woodland uh, silver pasture grazing system, and then also an unmanaged woodland grazing system up at Thompson Research Center. So this is the two-year project we have ongoing, um, and we're going to be recording animal performance and also uh, microclimate exposures of those animals. Um, so having uh, temperature and humidity tags attached to these different grazing groups to help monitor the different kinds of climatic experiences that they have in these different systems. Uh, additionally, Kendra is also currently in Senegal um, and she is almost done with her six month research project um, looking at adaptive land use strategies among pastoralists and farmers in Senegal. Um, this is a picture of her on a, on a field visit that she sent us. And she's really just been doing excellent work um, there. And uh, this particular project is looking at um, these different strategies of different groups and different types of farmers in Senegal. So just as a quick background, um, this map is taken from Kitchell and all in 2014, and it shows how in, um, in, in different parts of Senegal in the north, uh, the pastoralists will migrate and move their cattle and sheep and goats through different these different grazing corridors to uh, find grazing and forage throughout the season. Uh, but there is some conflict because while this is a traditional system and a traditional practice, 
urbanization, climate change, intensification of agriculture and privatization have all really created conflict and stressors on this traditional system, primarily in the form of uh, sedentary farmers who have permanent lands and don't migrate. And there is conflict now over this shared land space and the utilization of the grazing area um, for livestock. So Kendra is investigating how livestock and farming communities in these different regions of Senegal are adapting to these stresses. And also asking the question, is there a place for civil pasture as a strategy to, um, to adapt as well? Uh, so we're really looking forward to seeing what results uh, come from this study. It's been a really positive experience for her and uh, can't wait for, to share that all with you in the coming, in the coming months. Finally, uh, just a quick update. You probably have heard and will hear more about this, um, but if you haven't, the Center for Agroforestry was delighted to receive two very large uh, Climate Smart Agriculture grants from the USDA this past fall. Um, what that means uh, in our lab um, is, you know, the center being attached to both of these, but also there's specific silvopasture pasture components in both of these projects. So. The one that Ms. University of Missouri is uh, spearheading uh, with the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and also the Center for Agroforestry uh, is the Missouri Climate Resilient Crop Livestock Project or CIRCLE project. Uh, it's about $25 million. Um, and specifically in this project, we have a Grow Your Edges program that I uh, created or came up with to try to encourage farmers to plant trees in their field edges of their grazing paddocks to um, offer shade and promote the expansion of wooded areas on their grazing area. So we're targeting about 500 acres of civil pasture um, or agroforestry field edges for, as part of that project. Um, so really ramping up civil pasture outreach associated with that. We'll be hiring a technician that will be responsible for reaching out to um, and providing technical support for those recipients of incentive payments. And additionally, the Nature Conservancy has also uh, received a $65 million Climate Smart Ag grant and the Center for Agroforestry is administering um, some of the outreach associated with that in our region. And part of that will be civil pasture as well. So I'm part of both of those efforts and I am looking forward to seeing how both of these projects develop over time. So this is just a quick overview of updates from our lab. We have our first graduate, Seth Chrisman, uh, finished his master's project this de past December. And we're very, very proud and very happy to see him succeed in his project and um, send him out into the world with a master's in agroforestry. We also have two new incoming online students, Amanda Horn and Kara Shaw. We're happy to see them um, and welcome them into our lab. Also having some new hires, so our lab is expanding. We're gonna be recruiting for an MS student to uh, follow and take over the WordAC project in Seth's footsteps. And also I'm hiring a research technician to really help move some of these projects along and expand our capacity and start asking more research questions in other areas. Uh, we also have a, a grant that we have heard and uh, that we've received on a large cover crop project. So uh, we'll have more information on that for you later. And um, really just always, always asking more questions and always looking for more projects. So uh, happy to um, answer any questions. Here's my contact information and um, you always know where to find me. Thank you. Welcome, my name is Kendra Esparza Harris and I am a NEFA graduate fellow in the Center for Agroforestry. Today, I will present my research project titled Perceptions, Practice, and Barriers of Woodland Civil Pasture Adoption Among Missouri Livestock Producers and Forest Landowners. Civil pasture, the integration and management of trees, forage, and livestock has shown capabilities through economic production, social, and ecological benefits. However, adoption of the system remains significantly low. Natural resources and an aptitude for productive fertile savanna grasslands has shaped the state of Missouri's cattle industry and ensured a rank among the highest in cow-calf production. The expansion of the cattle industry transformed the oak savanna tall grass prairie landscape to conventional pasture grazing 
with the inclusion of livestock and fragmented woodlands within private lands known as livestock woodland grazing. To date, woodland grazing among farmers and landowners remains prevalent in Missouri because of convenience and necessity. However, the lack of management of the woodlands has led to undesirable ecological changes to include loss of diversity and production within woodlands, reduced forage yields, as well as adverse effects on animal productivity. Missouri's resource base, which supports woodlands, forage, and cattle inventory, highlights an opportunity to increase the adoption of woodland civil pasture, specifically among producers and landowners, and potentially facilitate further civil pasture research. Therefore, we aim to assess the current woodland grazing and civil pasture practices, perception and potential barriers among woodland civil pasture adoption in Missouri with the following objectives. To evaluate the characteristic profile to establish elements of production type, grazing management practices, land ownership, and woodland forestry management. Understand the knowledge and perceptions of woodland civil pasture among livestock producers and forest landowners and comprehend the current status of woodland civil pasture, awareness of benefits and barriers to civil pasture adoption. Through the Singer Grant, we developed a three-page asynchronous mixed mode survey to distribute throughout the state of Missouri. Following survey development, the survey was validated with peer tests and translated through the Canavio Center to increase accessibility. The survey was distributed between mid-February through mid-May 2022 through the Farm Journal's existing mailing list and electronic network to reach the target population of livestock producers and landowners. Preliminary statistical analysis through SAS was conducted to summarize categorical variables. Further analysis continues to examine relationships between variables and civil pasture adoption. We received a total of 400 responses 220 electronic and 172 mailed surveys, with a response rate of 6% for mailed surveys. Of the 282 individuals who responded to demographic section, the majority of the survey respondents were males between the ages of 66 to 75, white or European American with a bachelor's degree, and a gross income of their farm, an average over 100,000. These demographics were similar to demographic reported in a 2017 Census of Agriculture in Missouri State Profile, which suggests our response audience is similar to the population of interest in Missouri. Hello everyone, my name is Eric McKenzie and I'm a second year graduate research assistant working under Dr. Ashley Conway. My master's thesis project will examine the potential to use elderberry plant material as a feed supplement for ruminant livestock. In collaboration with Andrew Thomas, his team at the Southwest Research Center in Mount Vernon produced half of the sample fodder, with the other half coming from our work at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center in New Franklin. Elderberries ripen and are ready for harvest relatively early, from mid-August to mid-September. After harvest, the leaves stay on the plant well into the fall. The standard management practice for elderberry is to coppice the plants after the growing season in preparation for spring regrowth. This thesis project will determine the viability of using the post-harvest elderberry plant as a fodder source for ruminant livestock by analyzing the nutritive value as measured by neutral detergent fiber, acid detergent fiber, acid detergent lignin, and crude protein of leaf material across the growing season. While elderberry is browsed by the native ruminant white-tailed deer, it is also known to contain cyanogenic glycosides and it must be determined if the concentration of this innate toxin in post-harvest elderberries can be safely consumed by domesticated livestock. If so, integrated farming systems producing livestock and crops could create additional revenue potential by seasonal grazing of post-harvest elderberry. This study examined six different cultivars of elderberry at two different growing locations in Missouri. The first is at the Horticulture and Agroforestry Research Center in Plant Hardiness Zone 6A, and the second site is at the Southwest Research Center in Plant Hardiness Zone 6B. The next few slides will show the raw means for elderberry neutral detergent fiber, acid detergent fiber, and acid detergent lignin throughout the growing season, and then compare them to alfalfa and tall fescue at their approximate peak nutritive values. You can see these comparisons as we move from the spring and then into the midsummer.
and then into the early fall, with these fall numbers being of particular importance as this would likely be the time frame in which the elderberry plant fodder is consumed as a supplemental feed source. Crude protein and cyanogenic glycosides are currently under analysis and will be available in the first quarter of 2023. While the viability of using elderberry fodder is still unknown at this point, the inclusion of the crude protein analysis early next year will provide a more comprehensive understanding of the total digestible nutrients of the plant. The preliminary results are promising and are moderately comparable to tall fescue and alfalfa. If these promising results continue and the cyanogenic analysis proves it to be safe for consumption, elderberry fodder could be a nutritive feed supplement for livestock that offers the opportunity for integrated farms to diversify their operations. Thank you. My name is Seth Chrisman. I'm a master's student and research assistant. My project is on plant community response during establishment of woodland silvopasture in the Missouri Ozarks. Prior to European settlement, disturbance-mediated oak woodlands were a prevalent community type in Missouri, occupying an estimated one-third of the state's land area. These ecosystems are characterized by a continuous understory layer of diverse herbaceous flora and a discontinuous overstory of fire-adapted oak species. Anthropogenic low-intensity fire was the primary driver maintaining these ecosystems, but local populations of native herbivores also impacted vegetation densities. As a result of European settlement, land use change altered historical disturbance regimes, leading to the densification of woodland communities with losses in the richness and abundance of herbaceous species. So the restoration of oak woodlands is a key management goal in Missouri. Managed grazing may be a tool to aid restoration efforts, but limited research exists on restoring unmanaged woodlands using silvopasture, an agroforestry practice in which trees, forages, and livestock are intentionally integrated and intensively managed. The study is the first in a long-term project evaluating the ecosystem impacts of woodland silvopasture at Wordak Education and Extension Center in Cook Station, Missouri. The objectives of the study were to establish baseline plant community composition and structure data prior to silvopasture establishment, and to evaluate vegetation response to mid-story removal, prescribed fire, and seeding of native forages during establishment. Specifically, we measured understory species composition and abundance, understory species diversity and floristic quality, and mid-story and overstory structure. Three treatments were applied, a mid-story removal treatment, a prescribed burn plus mid-story removal treatment, and a control. Additionally, a split plot seeding treatment of a native forage mix was conducted within each of these main treatment areas. Pre-treatment inventory was conducted in summer 2021. Treatments occurred in spring 2022, and post-treatment data were collected in summer 2022. This diagram shows percent cover change by plant functional group and treatment, with percent change on the y-axis and treatment on the x-axis. I'll note that the values on the y-axis are not to the same scale for each plant group. The mid-story removal treatment significantly increased graminoid cover compared to the other two treatments, though the numerical increase was just over 2%. While not found to be statistically significant, the prescribed burn plus mid-story removal treatment had the greatest numerical change with a 10% reduction in shrub cover, a 5% decrease in understory tree cover, and a 5% increase in forb cover. So with only one year of post-treatment data, we observed changes in the understory toward a more herbaceous plant community. Repeated burns and further reductions in stand density are likely needed for significant increases in herbaceous cover and an adequate forage base for woodland silvopasture. Uh, silvopasture establishment and woodland restoration take time. It's not going to happen in one season, at least not with an emphasis on woodland restoration. And further research and long-term monitoring are needed to inform best management practices.